Welcome to the new edition of Euro Question, the webinar of the Jacques Delors Institute. Today, as we celebrate our 50 years Euro Question, we have the pleasure and the honor to welcome Pascal Lamy, the coordinator of the Jacques Delors think tanks in Paris, Brussels, and Berlin. Aside from Brexit, Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the most geopolitical, challenging development in Europe since the fall of the Berlin Wall. The EU integration has faced uh, many challenges in the past decades. The financial crisis in 2008, the migration crisis in 2015, and the COVID crisis in 2020. How this current war is going to impact strengthening or weakening the EU integration process. Before handing over to our uh, guest, I would just simply remind you that you have the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen where you can ask all your questions. We will come back to you at the end of the presentation. Mr. Lamy, you have the floor. Many thanks, uh, Lara, and thanks to uh, the Institute of Delors in Paris for hosting me today for this uh, 50th edition of uh, Euro Questions. I will start with a quote uh, by uh, Jean Monnet, who, for the youngest of you, was one of the inspirators of the EU Founding Fathers. And Jean Monnet uh, wrote at the time, and I quote, EU will be built through crisis and will be the sum of their solutions. This has been true roughly for the last 15 years. As uh, Lara Martelly just said, uh, it was true for the financial crisis in 2008, which resulted in a deepening of European integration. It was true for Brexit, it was true for COVID. All these steps recently led to more European integration. Hence, in my view, a stronger Europe. How about this time? Given that the invasion of Ukraine is certainly a much bigger geopolitical and geoeconomic shock than what we've had uh, for the last uh, 20 years. That's today's question. And my answer uh, is a typical uh, economist or politician answer, uh, the jury is out. It depends, and it's probably too soon to say today mm. whether or not Europe will emerge uh, stronger or weaker uh, from this uh, terrible challenge, which of course is first and foremost a challenge for our Ukrainian friends. They are on the front line. We are not but I see reasons why Europe could emerge stronger. When? 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 And I also can see reasons why it could emerge weaker, which we need to consider seriously. But starting uh, for, with the reason for being optimistic, at least in my view, a stronger Europe after the Ukraine war, I can see three reasons. The first is uh, this very strong demonstration and show of unity and solidarity. In a few hours after Russia invaded Ukraine, EU reacted very strongly, very quickly, and in a surprisingly united way. Of course, it took a few days or a few weeks to build uh, this enormous package of sanctions against Russia. Of course, it took a bit of discussion to decide that a part of a EU budget, which is not the EU budget full time, but which is a part of the EU budget uh, to pay for weapons that would be sent to Ukraine, which is a big step forward for the European Union. Overall, overall, This is something which Europeans and the rest of the world will remember as a big step in unity. Second reason uh, is that, uh, in my view, uh, this uh, challenge for Europe, this ordeal for Ukraine, but this challenge for Europe, will be a boost to uh, strategic autonomy 
into a more geopolitical Europe as advocated uh, by uh, the president of the commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, some time ago. I think it's pretty clear that the European Union needs stronger autonomous capacities to react to external shocks of this kind, whether it's the military shock, whether it's a military aggression, or an economic shock like the one we have uh, on energy. Third reason for believing that the EU could emerge stronger is that uh, this uh, challenge, this war, will be a boost uh, to the Green Deal, the very purpose of which is to decarbonize our economies uh, by 2050 with a uh, point in uh, 2030 at minus 55% for our emissions. I believe that given the weakness that depending on Russian gas has demonstrated, the other part of the coin is that it demonstrates the necessity to go further, stronger, more resolutely into greening our economies and making them less dependent on uh, fossil fuels, including gas. That's in a way the positive side. Now, there is also, in my view, a more negative side. I can also see reasons uh, for you to emerge weaker, more divided, less united, hence weaker. So one, I think, is uh, this huge economic shock which we are going through at the moment after a COVID period that weakened our economies, we now have a second double whammy shock, whether short-term or long-term. Short-term with this uh, incredibly high rise uh, increase in energy prices, which is hitting not only people, but also the economy, companies, firms, producers, whom the energy cost is an important element of uh, profitability or competitiveness. In the long term, uh, this is a very serious risk of degrading EU's competitiveness worldwide. If we pay medium long term our electricity, our energy, much more than the US, China, then we have a serious problem of competitiveness. And competitiveness is very important to European growth, given that medium long term, we are not in a favorable demographic position. We are losing people. The way to keep growing our economy is innovation and competitiveness. Competitiveness risks to be seriously hampered. Short term, the difficult economic situation we are in, starting uh, with Germany, but also with a country like France or Spain or Italy or others, this, it's a risk of social damage. And economics have often resulted in social damage because the weakest are less able to cope with the situation uh, than the strongest. It's civil political influences that would weaken the EU. Second reason uh, for believing uh, that it may not be good news for EU integration is uh, the increased East-West and North-South tensions on a number of issues which have always been part of the EU compromise machinery because countries, people do have the same view. And under the pressure of such external shock, these divisions may increase. For instance, uh, on sanctions, we can see that as our sanction packets grow in size and force, the difficulty of getting the necessary unanimity is increasing. What if in one or two next notes, 
we would be less united. This is a problem, and we've seen that, notably with a country uh, like Hungary, who only accepts EU sanctions if basically they don't have to apply them, which is a breach in uh, immunity. Other issues like uh, the attitude to NATO, the role of uh, the US in European defense, transatlantic relations. You can see, for instance, as a front line for keeping the US as the main part of European defense, why others, like France, for instance, prefer to rely more on uh, uh, European uh, uh, of uh, NATO. These discussions are increased by the Russian invasion. The reason, uh, which is a more global one, I think there is a risk of the uh, EU as a geopolitical entity not becoming more relevant, but less relevant worldwide. And that will be the case if no support in a sort of competitive battle between Washington, Beijing, and Moscow, sort of West against the West. Who is not in a battle between the West and the rest? You should not be in a battle between the West and the rest. Whatever fiction they may have in Washington, Beijing, Moscow, such a narrative. There is a danger of drowning the EU into a sort of Western soup that then would be opposed to the global south. I personally believe this is a real danger. Let me add uh, one reason uh, why the EU could get either stronger or weaker, because I'm not sure, arguments on both sides, uh, which is, of course, the impact of the invasion of Ukraine on enlargement. The decision to enlarge the EU to Ukraine, which brings other countries like Georgia, for instance, that then brings a number of Balkan countries into this enlargement conversation. May the EU stronger? Yeah, but we also know by experience enlargement negotiation that may last uh, 10 or 15 years may be divisive for the European Union and for the image it gives to the rest of the world. So finally, uh, given that there are reasons on both sides, for being optimistic about future progress. Others on being pessimistic, what, uh, what will make the difference? And that's my concluding uh, point. I think overall, what will make the difference is uh, that the EU serves correctly the best of resilience that in, has imposed on the European Union. Uh, to break, I think, uh, a good way of looking at that, which is the way um, Natalie Tocci from the III in, uh, in Italy has made it. Uh, resilience is three steps. Action, adaptation, bouncing forward. Action, okay. Adaptation, we probably are somewhere in this adaptation period. So far, a bit of modeling through, a bit of dumpy, but okay. So next is bouncing forward. This is the open question. When? Well, when it will be clear that this war is not a win for Russia, which remains the fundamental objective of the EU as a supporter of Ukraine. This to be the case, I see two conditions. Uh, the first one is uh, the Ukraine resistance capacity, which has been very surprisingly positive uh, for the moment. But we know we have a long winter ahead of us. We know that Russian bombs are destroying most of the energy, water infrastructures of this country. So, Ukraine 
will resist, but it will only resist the size of the Russian military pressure if you and US keep in Ukraine. And for this, we need support in US and EU public opinion. That's the first condition. Second one I see is uh, this uh, German, uh, Franco or Franco German couple, uh, which uh, for the moment uh, has a bit of a difficult time. Uh, I think it also depends on the capacity of the Germans and the French to address a number of their differences. Uh, which have been there for a long time on energy, on the uh, macro fiscal framework for the European Union, on European defense, which now may be a problem for the EU to bounce forward. I think this deserves sort of attention, work, conversation. This is why the three sisters, the Jacques Delors Institutes in uh, Paris, in Berlin, and in Brussels, have uh, started uh, working hard on that. So stay tuned Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Lamy, so, uh, for your enlightening presentation. Uh, as we have seen, the EU has many challenges ahead. Uh, so we received a few questions. If I could just grab my computer. Um, so maybe one question, Mr. Lamy. Uh, thank you for your uh, horizon. Do you think that the debate on the enlargement to Ukraine um, in sending back the actual um, enlargement process from the Balkans? Yes. I think it's very hard to believe uh, that uh, enlarging the Union to Ukraine, which is a totally new perspective, if we ask this question one year ago, people will say, you're mad. That's for later, later, later. So this is a turning point, and it inevitably will raise the question of the accession of other countries situated within uh, the uh, EU geography, hence, hence reopening this issue of the accession of uh, Balkan countries. Uh, I can say from the conversations and the contact I've had that whatever is my answer, they see it as the open way, their accession, which they say they've been waiting for too long. Thank you, Mr. Lamy. A second question. Are we inevitably heading towards a new transatlantic trade fight? Could we could it weaken or straighten the EU? I don't think uh, uh, the Ukraine invasion, uh, which is again a major geopolitical and geoeconomic cost, has a very strong trade component. Of course, uh, trade uh, between uh, Russia and uh, EU uh, will uh, suffer in volumes. It never was a real, real trade. It was trade in fossil fuels, it was trade in energy, it was trade somehow in grains, agriculture, but nothing like uh, a normal trade in the 21st century where you trade on the basis of uh, technological and skills comparative advantage. Uh, we have, and we will have trade issues with China and with the US, and we see um, uh, coming very soon given uh, the conditions which the US have put uh, to the electrification of their cars, which run contrary to WTO rules, at least in my view. The trade dimension uh, with uh, Russia uh, is not a serious one, except that we have to stop importing gas from Russia, which one can see as a trade problem, which in my view is much more of a political and an economic problem. Thank you. Uh, regarding the protectionism of the U.S. trade policy, uh, I can all highly recommend our newly new paper from Elvia Fabry available on our website. Um, another question regarding steel enlargement. Uh, there is still some bad criticism about the 2004 EU enlargement. Could we improve Macron European political community, community sorry, to build a second intergovernmental ring around the EU? According to you, well, I believe. That the intention 
the French presidents of the Republic uh, with this initiative of a European political community, which is a sort of grouping, rather loose, non-institutionalized, roundtable where European countries, whether belonging to the EU or not, have a conversation about common challenges. I think his view is that it can be a bridge between today, where we have EU and non-EU members, to another period, which I think France accepts in principle now, where quite a lot of these non-EU members will join. So I see that as a bridge. Currently, uh, the first step of that was reasonably positive. So, so far, so far, it seems to have a sort of better uh, flotation capacity than previous initiatives of this kind, uh, which did not float uh, uh, during the last uh, 50 years. Thank you. Another question. At this point, do you think could there be a long-term impact of the conflict on the Franco-German cooperation with the TU? I think uh, it uh, enlightens, it puts under the spotlight existing differences. Because medium and long term, I think inevitably these differences will have uh, to be addressed uh, by the necessary compromises because this is a fundamental condition for EU to move forward in its integration. And this, my view, is very simple. Uh, we need a stronger euro, Europe in this world, which will be dominated by China and US. A stronger Europe is a more united Europe. A more united Europe does not happen without a Franco-German more united position. It's not the essential condition. It's not the only condition, but it certainly is a major condition. And we've seen, as I mentioned, that on things like energy, like defense, where uh, the French and the German sensitivities are different and which matter a lot for EU to emerge stronger, we have problems that need to be addressed. I think it's pretty clear. I think uh, Jean Macron, nor Schultz, uh, in recent times, uh, pretended uh, there were an agreement on everybody. I also, again, particularly Lyon in Paris, Berlin, and Brussels, will be trying to contribute short term to finding solution. I think uh, what Jean Monnet said will play on the positive side. Yeah, let's hope for it. Uh, maybe another uh, question. So you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation uh, that, that this commission is a geopolitical one, but do you think the relationship with China will uh, weaken or strengthen the EU integration process? Well, I'm not that sure that the commission is a geopolitical animal, but I think uh, the meaning of this is that the EU should become a more geopolitical animal. Uh, as some say, uh, EU uh, glory is a sort of herbivore in a world of carnivores. Well, moving a bit more from herbivore to carnivore, I think, is what this means. The EU needs more power, more influence, more teeth. Vis a vis China, of course, but also vis also a vis the US, in case another. U.S. stands than the one that was taken uh, by the Biden administration uh, would be taken. With China, I'm all with this uh, triangle of China being a competitor, a rival, and a partner. The EU has to be strong enough to play the game with China on these three different layers. It's a rival politically. We want democracy to remain and to progress. This is not the Chinese view, unless they call it democracy with the Chinese characteristics, which for us doesn't really look democracy. Uh, they are a rival economically, and then we need to rebalance the economic relationship. And the Institut Jacques Delors, Paris, Berlin, and Brussels published recently. A good piece about that, which we were asked to table for the Evian meeting 
uh, between French and German business uh, last September. But China is also a partner in something like environment, for instance. So whatever proportion give to this relationship between rivalry, competition, and partnership, we need a stronger Europe to deal with what is now a strong China. And do you think that uh, with this strategic autonomy process going on and the war, uh, finally, could Europe be uh, a political power on the global stage? I hope so. so uh, we are not there yet. This will very much depend on whether EU has its own stance vis-a-vis -vis what is now called the Global South. Starting, of course, with a major geopolitical issue for us, which is Africa. The Chinese have an attitude vis-a-vis -vis the developing world, which is both trying to bring them on their political side, use them as a sort of provider of raw material uh, for the Chinese economy. The US won't bring China on their side, a bit like during the, the war, at the time where the US and Russia are competing to bring African countries on their side. We need a third position, which is a much more positive relationship with the global south. In my view, and we are working a lot on that in uh, Brussels, the, which is the first term, the Institute of law, which is devoted to uh, sustainable development to try and make the environment adaptation, mitigation, other solutions, the fundamental strategic axis of a new revamped EU Global South Corporation. This has started the EU Global Gateway, for instance. There still is a lot of way to go, as we can see, what's already happening uh, in the COP27 uh, in uh, Chernobyl, which uh, started uh, on Monday. Thank you, Mr. Lamy. And maybe a last question. Um, so in my little introduction, I mentioned Brexit uh, aside from the, the war, but do you think that now with the new uh, government in UK, the EU will finally have a, a more cooperative partner? I think it depends very much on the, on the uh, UK position, to be frank, and I'm not saying this as a negotiator. I don't have any negotiating responsibility in this uh, Brexit issue. I'm glad about that. I think uh, there are two things. Either a hard Brexit and showing that we can hit these Europeans and that that's the way to go remains, and in which case there will be no agreement, or, or we used to call them British pragmatism uh, who appears, and then they will realize uh, that uh, distancing themselves from the European Union is very costly. They are pragmatic, they will look to a cheaper solution and a cheaper solution assessed by compromise. On the, uh, on the uh, Irish uh, Sea border. Well, thank you, Mr. Lamy, for your presentation and answering all these questions. Um, thank you all for your participation. I remind you that we will send you the replay of this Euro question by email this afternoon. The next Euro question will be held on Wednesday, 23rd of November. We will welcome Cyril Brett, associate researcher at the Jacques Delors Institute. He will come back to us on the EU sanctions toward Russia. We will publish his analysis in the coming days. Uh, before closing this webinar, if I may, I would just like to thank a few people uh, uh, who accompany us through his 50 euro questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Sébastien Maillard, the director of the Jacques Delors Institute, uh, who sustained uh, for this idea of this new format. Um, all of our experts and colleagues who participate to this 50 euro question towards the last two years, uh, our uh, technical team, um, César Riviera, Paul-Antoine Tugayet, Tanguy Piochot and Clémence Monet. And lastly, I would like to thank Mathieu Meunier who had this idea of this format. And Mathieu has just left the Institute uh, a few days ago. So we would like to wish him all the best for this coming future. Thank you all for your participation and hopefully see you in two weeks. Merci, Monsieur Lamy.